I'm your host, Kaylee, and this is Rebel Wellness. Hello, hello, and welcome back to another episode of Rebel Wellness. In this episode, I'm going to help demystify the menstrual cycle. Throughout a typical 28 to 30 day cycle, you may notice shifts in your energy and mood. This is normal. Understanding the hormones at work in your body and the ways you can expect them to fluctuate over the course of your cycle can really be the key to setting realistic movement and nutrition expectations every month. I'm also going to unpack the effect that hormonal birth control can have on your hormones, and I'll suggest some steps you can take to stay nourished and feel your best no matter what your relationship is to your monthly cycle. This is a three-part series, and I really want you to come out of this hopefully looking at your period more like a report card of how your previous month went and better understand that you have a little bit more control over how it affects you than you might think. I know this because this is exactly the challenge that I have been going through as I've guided a lot of my female clients through rebalancing and better understanding the hormones that are in play with their menstrual cycle and what it means for everything else going on in your body. In this episode, I really wanted to share some of my personal experience. I hope that it is helpful for you so you understand that maybe it's relatable to where you're at, or maybe it's somebody you know. So I hope you do also share this episode with somebody you think that this could really help, because honestly, I can't believe that there's so much that I'm even still learning about the female body and cycling. And I know that as I've had these conversations with many of my clients, it's been a world of help for them and a world of help for us when we're kind of approaching their fat loss goals, fitness goals, etc. But I'm not going to go to the nitty gritty. There's some great podcasters up there that are by doctors and such that do talk with all the jargon. I'm trying to make it a little more digestible. So we're going to talk about what you should understand foundationally. Let's first start with if you are somebody who is utilizing any type of birth control, whether it's IUD, oral contraceptives, the implanon in your arm, any artificial hormones are going to alter your cycle. That's how they work. Basically, they stop you from ovulating and they usually thicken the lining in your uterus in efforts to double protect you from getting pregnant. If this is you, this talk isn't exactly how your individual body is probably working right now. If you are somebody who is ready to detox from fake hormones and shift to what they're calling, uh, they used to call it the family planning method, but I think they're just calling it the cycle tracking method now. If you are somebody in that category where you're curious about going off of these hormones, which is something I would recommend you consider because it's extremely underestimated how much that affects our health, including our mental health. So if you're finding that you're having a really hard time losing weight, uh, you're extremely mood swingy, you know, if you've been on oral contraceptives or hormones for extended period of time. I'm talking like three years to a lot of us started a lot longer ago. So some I know have been on it for 15 or 20 years. There's a good chance that your liver has been burdened, your detox pathways have been burdened, and you've never ovulated. So your body hasn't balanced back out. If that's you, I would say consider trying the natural method, at least to give your body a break from the fake hormones. And I say that with all the most love for sexual freedom and everything like that. It is almost honestly more sexually freeing to be naturally cycling because you actually get that kind of spike in your follicular phase where you feel sexy, you want to have sex, you know, that tends to get lost because you're not ovulating and your body's no longer producing those spikes and dips that are necessary to get a libido. If you're losing a libido and you've been on oral contraceptives, it is most likely the contraceptives. And I know that that might be kind of controversial, but I really encourage you to open your mind to this concept as it might be an option or a reason that these things are going on. Many of my clients and I have discovered that they have been suffering from symptoms from their oral contraceptives that their doctors kept saying, oh no, that can't be the birth control. Anything from excessive weight gain to 
extreme loss of libido and depression or major anxiety very much can be your body's response to artificial hormones. Explore that for yourself, but I wanted to kind of paint that picture in the beginning of this episode so that if you are not somebody who's naturally cycling, this might not be as helpful for you. Overall, if you choose to shift to natural cycling, this will be a very helpful series to listen to. All right. So technically speaking, there's a lot of variations of what can be considered a quote unquote normal cycle, but for the grand scheme as what has been studied, surveyed, etc., a normal healthy cycle should be anywhere from 26 to 30 days. Anything exceeding that or less than that is going to be in a different category. So first, so we're understanding the menstrual cycle, like a natural healthy menstrual cycle with ovulation. You're going to be looking for 28 minimum to 30 days of your menstrual cycle. The most important thing you can do to learn where your cycle is at is cycle tracking. This can be by you just doing it manually, or it can be with a tracker app. But first, you should really take at least three months where you're tracking your cycle. If you don't do that, there's a good chance that you are kind of missing out on a lot of the good intel that your body's giving you. Our periods are a like report card of our health. It's one of the easiest ways to kind of know, oh, was this last month a little bit off? Was it good? Your period tells you a lot, which is pretty awesome. But at the same time, when you're not actually aware of it, you're missing out on all that information. So your period is kind of split into three major phases. Technically, the two phases are follicular phase and luteal phase. However, you do have ovulation, so sometimes I kind of think of that as like a little part of your phase. You could also think of it as the marker of the shift into luteal phase. So you start follicular, aka you're making the follicles. Ovulation is where you have a matured follicle. And then your luteal phase is when you're downshifting, preparing to shed the lining and all of the work that your body put in to make a nourishing kind of happy space in your uterus for implantation should you choose to and then you shed and then you go back to your period which is actually the beginning of your follicular phase days 1 through 14 are your follicular phase your period is part of your follicular phase so day 1 is when your bleeding begins so if you're tracking you're tracking your actual bleed and i'm not talking about spotting an actual bleed is going to be day one. A healthy bleed cycle should be around three to five days of bleeding. If it's extending past that, sometimes that can be healthy. Usually that's a little too long. If it's under that, like if you're only bleeding for one or two days and it's really light, there's also something that is kind of a little bit off hormonally. So assuming this is a five day period and kind of a 29 day cycle, Your follicular phase is where your estrogen begins to spike. This occurs around, let's say, day six or day seven. And once the bleeding stops, your uterus has lining that thickens to essentially prepare for a possibility of a pregnancy. But it thickens so that it can be enriched with blood and nutrients for the potential of implantation. So in efforts to not be too confusing with jargon, The pituitary gland in your brain releases follicular stimulating hormone during this part of your phase, and that is what is going to begin the start of the rise of follicles in your ovaries. The strongest follicle is what becomes your egg, and it detaches and makes its way down your fallopian tubes, heading towards your uterus. This is essentially where if there is sperm present, anywhere from day 11 to day 16 or so, fertilization of that egg could occur. And sometimes we drop more than one egg and that's where you usually see situations such as twins occur. And if an egg gets fertilized, it will then implant or attempt to implant in the uterine wall. And then it spends time during the luteal phase trying to grow and develop and essentially begin the process of a really strong fetus. If the egg isn't fertilized or implantation doesn't occur, then hormonal changes 
signal your uterus to prepare to shed its lining and then the egg breaks down and is shed along with the lining. You're going to, this is where you kind of feel some of your symptoms like the cramping, the shedding of the lining. Then you stop bleeding. You're still in the follicular phase. Estrogen is still climbing. It's going to keep climbing until you hit right before ovulation. During this phase, you have follicles that are maturing. You emotionally are probably feeling a little bit sexier. You usually are at your best physique during this part of your phase. So basically day five until day 14. This is when you're kind of feeling your best. You have the most energy um, and you are a little bit more creative, you know, um, for your body as well. Oftentimes we usually see like our lips are a little fuller. We're kind of just basically in our most attractive state during this part of our cycle. Once you hit ovulation, you're going to be experiencing the most sex drive. You're probably having a lot of interest in different sexual activities, going out, talking to people. If you have a partner, you know, you're more interested in them. (laughs) That's because you have a matured follicle that's ready to be kind of met with a sperm to create a baby. If you're not in the business of making a baby, you're going to want to use contraception probably day six or seven all the way up until day 20 or so if you want to be the safest possible. From what I've learned in my personal experience, that is going to be the kind of most fertile zone. That late into your luteal phase for a lot of people may not be fertile, but there is still, I like to give a really nice cushion. (laughs) The second half, after day 14, you're in your luteal phase. So This is when we're kind of getting into a calmer state. So what's happening during luteal phase is your progesterone should be spiking. If you do not ovulate and there's different situations such as being on hormonal birth control or having an anovulatory cycle, you most likely didn't ovulate. Therefore, your cycle might be a little bit shorter and that's because you didn't really develop full mature follicles because your HPA and your HPO axis in your brain did not stimulate the FSH and the LH, which are the hormones responsible for helping a follicle get matured. And ovulatory cycles happen because of either too much stress, PCOS, um, aka hormone imbalances, hormonal birth control, of course, as well as over-exercising or overtraining, which essentially is a stressor. So basically, Two main reasons of not ovulating would be hormonal imbalances caused by too much stress and or hormonal imbalances based because of hormonal birth control. Those two reasons are usually why you don't ovulate, therefore your cycle will be shorter. So if you're landing anywhere between like that 21 to 24 day cycle total, sometimes like for myself, I'm usually a 28 to 30 day cycle and a 26 is where I have kind of found to be my anovulatory cycle. And so it's kind of person to person. Not every 26 or less means directly an anovulatory cycle. However, for most women that have been interviewed or medically evaluated, they tend to land in the category where they had such a short cycle in general that it points towards their follicular stimulating hormone or any other part of your HPO axis, your hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis decided essentially for some reason, whether it's stress or whatever we took on the previous month or the previous days preceding this part of our cycle and decided not to create follicles and drop any eggs in general. So this happens a lot more than we think. It doesn't mean necessarily something's wrong with you. It just is that your brain and your body decided that it's not a safe month to ovulate because basically your body is just trying to decide whether or not you're in a viable position to carry a healthy pregnancy. That's really what the body is just doing. And so this all applies regardless of if you are trying to have babies because it's just talking about how our bodies require healthy ovulation more often than not in general for healthy hormones. So that's pretty much why we're talking about it so in depth is just that it's really important that you understand what this part of your physiology is going to do for you for the long run more than just create babies. 
So yes, you can definitely have a healthy cycle that's 24 to 30 days, but when you're going 24 down to 21, while that can still be normal for some people, there's a strong chance that it means you have a shorter luteal phase, which can typically mean less fertility because you aren't letting that egg that's implanted and embedded in your uterine lining have enough time to to grow, develop, and hunker down pretty strong in that area. So this correlates with progesterone not being present enough for a lot of women who are dealing with infertility or miscarriages because this is usually the reason miscarriages occur is your luteal phase is too short because it's not stimulated by enough progesterone or many other things that go into play. Again, this isn't the only reason this happens, but this is a very strong reason this happens. So that's why we want to see a longer luteal phase after ovulation, because it's going to allow your body longer time, healthier time to have this really strong, healthy progesterone part of your cycle. If you have a healthy luteal phase, you're going to want it to be 14 days long or so as well. This is going to be nice for your body because you do shift into like a calmer state. Estrogen and progesterone are like the main sex hormones uh, that are involved with your menstrual cycle. A ton of different hormones are involved, but those are the main ones we kind of watch as far as your menstrual cycle goes. They're besties in the sense that one inverses the other. So you want to have natural progesterone, and I'm not talking about fake progesterone or artificial progesterone. It doesn't work quite the same. It also is usually in higher doses if you're using it as like the mini pill or the depo shot. Your body doesn't receive it the exact same way as your natural progesterone, and that's where it becomes kind of an issue if you're taking it for contraception. Progesterone is your pregnancy hormone. It's supposed to make you feel like you're constantly pregnant already. That's quote unquote what it says or what doctors will tell you. That's not exactly what's going on in the body, but it is going to keep your uterus lining like high and thick and always there. And it's supposed to deter the ability for a sperm to attach to your egg. When you're not ovulating, you're just getting an increase in oestrogen and then it's not being inversed by your natural progesterone, which becomes a problem which typically is where we see estrogen dominance, where there's too much estrogen in the body in comparison to progesterone. It's not being challenged. We see it a lot more nowadays, especially because there's a lot of endocrine disruptors in our environment that mimic estrogen or different estrogens in the body. And then that also increases estrogen in the body, causing a lot of females to typically pack on body fat without hardly even trying. This happened to me. That's where I learned about it. I actually just kind of was brainstorming it the first time I got off of um, the birth control pill and I ballooned up, had no idea what was going on. I figured maybe because I was taking fake estrogen, my body stopped producing it. And then when I got off of it, my body was overshooting it, making too much estrogen. That's what I thought was happening. What actually was happening is just that I was never ovulating and I was never producing my own progesterone. So then once I got off of it, I had too much estrogen in my body and my body did continue to produce more estrogen, but my body wasn't cycling yet to produce more progesterone to inverse it. Therefore, my body was just depositing fat like crazy because I was also highly stressed. Cortisol and estrogen are a good little buddy system for depositing fat. So (laughs) I was in a position where I put on, I think like 30 pounds in three and a half months. And it was near miserably hard to get rid of it. And I'm going to level with you right now. This was such a learning experience for me as a coach because I fluctuated with my weight several different times in my life prior to this incident, but nothing was as challenging for me as this phase And I will give a little tip for those of you listening that are either past clients, present clients, friends, family. This was 2018. If you were to look back at my Instagram, 
there's not a ton of pictures of me in that year. I don't love the fact that I didn't want to share myself during this struggle as much, but I talked about it later as, especially as I went through the healing process and better, better understood it. But I just want you guys to know that like, even as a fitness professional, health professional, and somebody who is a huge advocate for body confidence, body neutrality, et cetera, it's a learning curve and it's something you practice. So this was my first incident where I really had to come out of it and observe the feelings of unexplainable weight gain, puffy face. Like I went to New Orleans with my sister and I thought it was just my drinking and eating habits during that trip. But I can attest now I went earlier this year with my boyfriend and we ate and drank as much as we wanted, probably more than my sister and I did because my sister and I had one day less than my boyfriend and I did. And I didn't gain any weight because my hormones were balanced. So I know now that that was not what contributed at all. <laughs> like three days of eating and drinking, really not that much more than I had in the past, should not have resulted in sudden 30 pounds of fat out of nowhere. I thought maybe it's because I was having a glass of wine a little more frequently in the evenings and I was stressed, kind of, that contributed to the estrogen dominance, but it wasn't what really caused it. I had no idea that it was my birth control that had caused this issue. And I also want to note that I did everything in the book to try to stop the fat gain. I had every skill in the toolbox available to me to practice at what I preached. I can tell you that for one whole month, I followed my macros and weight lifted. No change. Weight was still coming on. Face was still super puffy. Wasn't sure what was going on. I was so paranoid about the rapid fat gain that I started implementing the crash dieting techniques that we all know and love. Increase our running, cardio, cardio, cardio. Reduce our food, practically starving myself. And I was logging food. Like I'm telling you guys, anybody who thinks that your metabolism and hormones don't affect fat gain, don't understand how the female body deposits fat. I will totally take on arguments with people who don't take the time to learn nuances to metabolic health for females, especially, especially in a world like now, again, endocrine disruptors, uh, stressor levels that are higher than ever before for females. And we're all taught to underestimate the stress and all of these different expectations and body products that we put on ourselves that we don't even know what chemicals are in them, that how they're going to affect us. That's why the female body is hardly ever studied in scientific studies. We are not a controllable variable. We fluctuate with our cycle. All of that to say the other techniques I implemented that stereotypically calories in calories out equation was not working. I did that for two months, two months, guys. The worst thing I probably had during that two months is like two glasses of wine. I was running up and down the hills. I was hiking. I did some weightlifting still, of course, and I was eating in a deficit and I brought that deficit down like really low for myself. Nothing was working. That's what really made me delve into why do we need to have natural cycles? So back to the luteal phase, you're moving through it. You're starting to get some of those cranky PMS, premenstrual syndrome symptoms. So those tend to kick in around day 21 of your menstrual cycle in general. Once we learn that it is normal for us, like the week preceding the week of our period to have PMS, that is why it's called pre-menstrual <laughs> syndrome. Um, I don't know about you, but a lot of my life, I always thought that PMS should just happen like on my period. But then I was starting to be like, I kind of feel better after day one of my period. It's starting to get better feeling. <laughs> That's where your luteal phase is actually where you're going to get more of the cravings, mood swings, water retention, um, your body's prepping to break down the lining. It's holding on to the lining, but it's starting, your progesterone is starting to increase and then decrease and your estrogen has been decreased significantly and they kind of meet in the middle right before your cycle and then your estrogen starts to spike again. That's where you should be hopefully starting to bleed around day 28 all the way up to day 30. 
And that's if you hit a full healthy luteal phase, that is a really good, happy, healthy period. So you want to see about 28 to 30 days. You sometimes can actually feel your ovulation happening on day 14, day 13, day 15, around there. That's a really good way of getting in tune with your body is when you actually can feel your body going through the cycle. If you are not feeling that or you've just never paid attention to that before, I invite you to give yourself a three-month challenge where you get as in tune with your cycle as possible. And if your cycle isn't really matching all of what I'm talking about, there's a good chance that something's off and that would be worth exploring with a women's health practitioner, uh, whether that's like a PCP or if you can invest in your health and look for a women's health focused naturopathic doctor or functional medicine doctor that would be an even better look into what is going on with your body so if we take all of those and think about each portion of your cycle first phase is when you're bleeding this is going to be your kind of least comfortable phase It's a good time for you to be reflective. You might feel a little more withdrawn from people. You might want to kind of take space for yourself. This is a great time for kind of more inward focus. You might find some good creativity during this time, or you might just kind of want to like relax and rest. This is a great time for you to kind of chill out first phase. Your second phase is when you're kind of getting your sexy on, like you feeling a lot more active. You are a little more aware. You're also feeling pretty creative, which is great. And you might have a little more clarity, concentration. You might do a lot more power work for yourself. You might feel a little bit more stamina, um, especially if you're kind of conquering stuff in the workplace or with your children, family, etc. Then your third phase is when you're probably starting to become a little bit more empathetic. Um, this is when your progesterone should be spiking and your estrogen should be dropping. So you might do well to have a little more teamwork and or support others. You might wanna call more friends during this phase of your month. And it's also a good time for you to kind of reflect on some stuff for yourself, journaling, et cetera. Um, I would say first phase and third phase are kind of good times as far as female energy goes to kind of do a lot of that reflection emotional work. And then your fourth phase is kind of like your wild woman phase. It's going to be very emotional, like in a sense where stuff that you might be kind of repressing or holding onto is going to come out. And a lot of times we tend to hear people say like, oh, are you on your period? You know, usually you'll get like a bunch of male feedback where they're just like, oh, you must be almost on your period and stuff. And I know how annoying that sounds. People might think it's not feminist to agree. However, when you really learn your period and how much it does affect our emotions, you'll completely understand that, yes, unfortunately, our mood is impacted immensely by our cycle. And that's not something to necessarily feel bad about. Um, A friend and I were talking about this one day where I was just kind of feeling outer body. I was like, thinking of pretty much nothing all that really important. And then I feel like crying and punching the sky. And then I'm like, oh, I'm in this latter phase, my luteal phase. This makes sense. And I told her, I was like, I just feel crazy. I don't, you know, I just am pissed off about this or that about my partner. And (laughs) she was like, you know, I wouldn't just write off these feelings because obviously there's some part of you that is, uh, letting these feelings flow, but at the same time, understanding that it's kind of this kind of divine feminine energy that like we get to kind of express it by default of what our body is doing inside, um, which can be a great thing, or it can be the kind of stereotypical, uh, quote unquote, crazy time. So that's going to be your fourth phase. And that is probably most people's least favorite phase, but I encourage you to kind of think of it as a good time to um, explore yourself and identify problems going on that you might be um, avoiding because you're going to be very good at being a little more inward and assertive during this time. (laughs) You might not be as kind of meek or shy to uh, 
uh, approach certain problems in your life. So it's kind of a good, like a superpower. Like even though you might feel like you're just batshit crazy, you also might just be doing the thing that you're supposed to be doing and your better uh, judgment isn't blocking you. (laughs) So, all right. So that kind of wraps up the understanding the general physiology of the menstrual cycle. I hope that was really helpful for you. And I hope that if you have any questions, you shoot me a DM on the at Rebel Wellness podcast or at Coach by Kales. I would love to chat with you more and answer some of those questions directly in the next Q&A podcast that's going to come after this series is over. But overall, I hope that that was helpful for you and a little less confusing than some of the deeply scientific explanations, even though part of it is going to rely on learning a little bit of the science to better understand your own individual body, because that's how we get empowered is by learning ourselves and knowing exactly what our body is doing, not gauging by what everybody else's body is doing. I look forward to seeing you guys pop up, listening to the future episodes coming here soon about how you approach your nutrition and your fitness in relation to your menstrual cycle. Happy Sunday! Thanks for joining me on this week's episode of Rebel Wellness. If you loved what you heard and you are ready to take your wellness journey to the next level, Follow me on Instagram at Coach by Kales for daily nuggets of health and fitness wisdom. We release new episodes weekly on Sundays, so be sure to click that subscribe button so you never miss an update. As always, lean into your strength, walk with confidence, and celebrate your nourishment. We'll catch you next Sunday on Rebel Wellness.